just going to uh, spend a few moments in prayer now, after which I will hand over to him. I should have said at the beginning, I should have welcomed you, man. Sorry. Um, a few slips this morning. Apparently, I got some new numbers wrong. So there we are. The Lord knows. So um, welcome, Andrew, and we look forward to what you have to say to us. So let's pray then. Heavenly Father, this morning, we want to bring you our prayers of thanksgiving for all your love and grace to us. For your son Jesus, who gave himself for us, who died so that we, through faith in him, might live a new and abundant life, indeed might have eternal life. We thank you for bringing us together this morning from all our circumstances. And I pray for one another, for our church family, that each one will need, will receive from you the strength they need. You know the uh, week that has gone before for each and every one of us, for some trials and disappointments, for some uh, triumphs of life. Uh, Lord, you know it all. Our lives are open to you. And uh, we just pray for one another that we will know what it is to turn to you and to find in you all that we need. Remember those who are not with us this morning, some unwell, some sad, uh, and some simply not able to be here. Lord, we pray for them all that wherever they find themselves, that they will like us, experience your nearness to them. And Heavenly Father, we remind ourselves that we live in a wider world, a spoiled world, a world of war and famine and natural disaster. As we think of these things, we, we hardly know what to pray for, it's beyond us. But we remember that reminder from your word last week, it's nothing too hard for the Lord. And we bring our prayers to you for these uh, places, so many. And for those of your children who are <coughs> serving as uh, missionaries and aid workers and the like of Mary and Christ, seeking to serve you amongst those that are in real need. Be to them all that they need, we pray. We pray for the rulers of our country as we're exhorted by your word to do. We pray for them to be ruled by men and boys, well, and women who are wise and compassionate. We pray for the influence of uh, believing uh, Christians amongst members of parliament, House of Lords, and uh, local governments, and so on. Lord, strengthen them. Give them the wisdom that comes from you, and uh, enable them to be sort of light in the places where they are. And we pray for ourselves now as we're here, as we've come to hear your word. We pray for Andrew, that you'll be to him all that he needs. Bless him for the time he has spent in prayer and preparation. And help us as we listen, that we will be those who hear and obey. Heavenly Father, there's so much we need, but so much we have when we give thanks. And we bring our prayers to you this morning. With thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your welcome this morning. It's good to be with you. And greetings from Providence Baptist Church in Dilton Marsh near Westbury. Um, now this morning I'm asking us to speak about uh, Isaac from Hebrews 11 verse 20, um, which reads as follows, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. But in order to understand what that's about, we need to understand what it's referring to, so we turn these in our Bibles to Genesis uh, chapter 27. 
We're going to begin reading at verse 18. <laughs> Genesis chapter 27, verse 18. If you're not familiar with the story, um, Abraham, as you'll have been hearing about in uh, previous weeks, um, he had his promised son, uh, Isaac, after many years of waiting. Isaac then married a woman by the name of Rebecca, and she was told that she was going to have twins. And uh, she was also told that the older was going to serve the younger. Uh, in Genesis 27, we find that Isaac is preparing to give the blessing to Esau uh, rather than giving it to Jacob. So that wasn't right. But Rebecca, she and Jacob had the plan uh, so that Jacob would get the blessing. And so Rebecca prepares a meal uh, for uh, Jacob to take him to his uh, elderly father. And that's where we're going to pick up the reading now. Genesis 27, verse 18. He, that is Jacob, went to his father and said, My father. Yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. <laughs> Should have said last week, haven't they? But uh, Jacob is in disguise virtually. He's uh, got goat skins on, so he feels hairy. His brother was hairy, and he's wearing some of his brother's clothes. So he's counseling like his brother as well, but he didn't have aftershave in those days. <laughs> so, verse 20 Isaac asked his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord your God gave me success, he replied. And Isaac said to Jacob, Come near, so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father Isaac and touched him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau? He asked. I am, he replied. And he said, my son, bring me some of your game to eat, so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him, and he ate, and he brought some wine, and he drank. Then his father said to him, come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. And Isaac caught the smell of his clothes. He blessed him and said, ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's riches, richness, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. After Isaac finished blessing him, and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Enoch came in from hunting. I think he prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he gave it to him. My father, please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. His father, Isaac, asked him, Who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn, Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate just before you came and I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he has taken advantage of me. He took my birthright, and now he's taken my blessing. Then he asked, Haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him Lord over you and have made all his relatives his, his servants and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept aloud. His father Isaac answered him, your dwelling will be away from the earth's riches, from the earth richness away from the Jew of heaven above you. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. But when you go restless, 
you will throw his yoke off your neck. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we have your word in our own language, that we have to read it for ourselves. But Lord, we know that it's one of the better that we need the help of your Holy Spirit. Lord, without your Holy Spirit's help, we are, we are helpless. And we can understand nothing. So Lord, we pray for your help, your Spirit's help this morning in each of our hearts uh, to understand your words, to receive it, and uh, to be able to apply it, to live it out uh, day by day. So Lord, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we come to Isaac this morning. But if you're looking at Hebrews 11, as you are as a church, um, what we need to do is to remember that also the first few verses of Hebrews chapter 12. Let's turn to them now. As I'm sure many preachers have told you before, everything is about conflict in God's word. We must never take God's word out of context. Uh, we mustn't look at Hebrews 11 just as a gallery uh, of um, faithful men and women of God who had faith in God just for the sake of admiring them. Like you go to a, you know, an art gallery and admire all the paintings and think, well, that's very nice, and then leave and forget all about it. But if you read the first um, couple of verses of Hebrews 12, Having said all that he said in chapter 11 about all the people he's talked about, he then says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the ones I've just told you about, <laughs> let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Again, that's what chapter 11 has been all about. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endures such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So that's what chapter 11 is all about. It's inspiring us, teaching us to throw off the sin, to run the race, to fix our eyes in Jesus, to consider him, not to grow weary, and not to lose heart. Again, we need to remember who Hebrews was being written to. It was being written to Jewish Christians who were having persecution, a very serious persecution, and they were being tempted to go back to the ways of Judaism, back to all the ceremonies of the law of, of Moses and so forth, and to turn their backs on this very strange gospel of a, a Messiah who was crucified and then rose again. Of course, the Jews weren't being persecuted. <laughs> So the temptation was there, temptation there to give up and go back to their old ways. And so that's again we need to learn that as we're reading uh, this chapter. They're not to grow weary, they're not to lose heart. And all these men and women of faith were to help them uh, to go forwards and not to turn back. And so we come to verse 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. Uh, putting that verse in verse one, which tells us what faith is, right at the very, very beginning, we can say, by faith, Isaac was confident in what he hoped for, and he was assured about what he did not see. And as he blesses his sons, he was, in a way, he was prophesying about their future, and he was also um, giving them the blessings, of, certainly for, for Jacob, of prosperity and of flourishing under the old covenant, the covenant that had been made to Abraham, and it would also be made with Jacob as well. But first, let's consider Isaac's faithful father. I know you've already heard something about Abraham. We can't really just consider Isaac in isolation because obviously he's Abraham's son, and the two are very much uh, uh, intertwined. Uh, Stuart Hollyoaks helpfully summarizes this section of Hebrews 11. Well, this chapter in Hebrews 11 by saying faith looks forward when there is seemingly nothing to look forward to. And that's exactly what was the case uh, with Abraham and Isaac. Abraham, remember, was told to sacrifice his son, his only son, his promised and precious son. The son he had waited around 25 years to be born. 
And yes, he wavered at times, but yes, he still believed that God would send a son. Of course, he did. But then God says sometime later, I want your son. And so Abraham had nothing to look forward to. He'd been told to sacrifice his son. But yet, by faith, Abraham did look forward because he reckoned that God could raise Isaac from the dead. He feared that God couldn't lie about what God was going to do and how he got to left him and be the father of many nations. His children would be as the sand on the seashore. God couldn't lie. His word couldn't be broken. So everything looked lost and he still went up to Mount Moriah with Isaac. He was in an age where he realized that there was something missing. There was no animal to sacrifice. But when his father said that the Lord would provide, it seems he accepted that. What he was thinking as he was bound and put on the altar, uh, we only, only he and the Lord and Abraham know. Uh, but uh, we do wonder what his faith was like then as he raised his dagger. Abraham raised his dagger to kill his son. So Abraham's faith was vindicated. No, Isaac's life was spared. And the ram was sacrificed instead. But Isaac's at that incident, of course, was prefiguring the death of Christ himself. And he is the one who has died in our place. But I can't imagine what impression that must have left uh, on Isaac for as long as he lived. I don't know about you, but um, I think our childhood memories can be some of our most vivid memories, can't they? I mean, I've got a, a mother-in-law who's, who's 90, and um, you know, she may not be able to remember what she did yesterday, or even a few hours ago, uh, but not to remember her childhood. She can remember living on the farm and doing the war and so forth. And she can tell you all about it. Very, very vivid. So I'm sure this, this was a vivid memory for Isaac all his life of that experience uh, on Mount Moriah. So Isaac grew up in a family where he saw faith in action. He saw that God can be trusted, which was different from Abraham, his father, because Abraham, he grew up in a completely pagan and godless culture. Of course, Abraham was called out of that, but Isaac was then born into a covenant family. And he would have known what happens when he did, when Abraham did trust God, but he would also know what had happened when Abraham didn't trust God. What would happen when you didn't trust and you didn't trust? He had it there in Ishmael, didn't he? His older half brother. He was 14 years older than Isaac. And he was born because Abraham and Sarah thought that God wasn't going to provide a son through Sarah, so they took matters into their own hands with Sarah's maid Hagar, and Ishmael was born that way. But God said, no, it's not the way. I will give you a son, Abraham, and Sarah, you will have a son, and he will be uh, the son of promise. So in Ishmael, Isaac could see what, what happens when things go wrong, that he was the child of promise. But of course, overall, we know, don't we, that Abraham walked with God, he was the friend of God, and he met with the pre-incarnate Christ in the days before Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. And Isaac would have been told that he alone, as we said, was the child of promise. God had made a covenant with Abraham, and now he had made it with Isaac. And Isaac was a key part of that covenant. God said to Abraham in Genesis 12, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. And that covenant is restated in Genesis 17 and again in Genesis 22. Can you imagine having all that listing on your shoulders? It was a, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And that was going to happen through Isaac. The enormity of the situation. And that situation was a result, wasn't it? Of God's grace, because Abraham had done nothing to deserve it, his call, had he? And his father and Abraham's faith as he responded in faith uh, to God's call. So that's the background, if you like. That's Isaac's faithful family growing up with Abraham, his faithful father. 
But then we also have, secondly, we have Isaac's fractious family. It was a, it was a difficult family, as we'll see, as we've read and heard. Um, but before we look at that, there are also some indications um, of how we see that Isaac was a man of faith. Genesis 24, verse 63, we read that Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. On that occasion, um, his father had sent a servant away to find him a wife, to find a wife for Isaac, his son. And so here, Isaac is out in the evening uh, meditating. Now, he's not meditating in the, in, the, in the modern way of meditating, where you sort of try to clear, empty your mind of everything and just think about nothing. Now, I'm sure he was meditating on the promises of God. He was filling his mind with the promises of God. All the weight of those promises. You know, all the nations of the earth were to be blessed through him. He was waiting the one who was going to be his wife, through whom those promises were going to be fulfilled. And then Genesis 35, when Rebecca has become his wife, um, you know, they couldn't have children. So verse 21, we need Isaac pray to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer. And Rebecca, his wife, conceived. You see, he was a man of prayer. And the Lord heard his prayer. Prayer it was based on the promise of God. The Lord, you promised I'm going to be the father of a great nation. I need to have some children. And the Lord heard and answered his prayer. And twice we also read that the Lord himself appeared to Isaac. And then in chapter 26, the covenant is restated to Isaac. He hears it so he's like firsthand. It says, the Lord appeared to him and he said, don't go down to Egypt, dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land and I will be with you and I will bless you for to you and your offspring I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give to you the offspring, all the, to your offspring, all these lands and in your offspring all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So those things show us, don't we, that Isaac was a man of faith. A man of prayer, a man of faith. But as we said, they were also problems in this family. Big problems. The biggest problem was favoritism. Favoritism in a family is never, ever a good thing. And we see that more than once in the Old Testament. As I mentioned, uh, Esau and Jacob uh, were twins. Esau was born first, and then Jacob. And they were told, Rebecca was told before twins were born that the older Esau would serve the younger Jacob. But they went on, the parents went on to have their favorites. Isaac's favorite was Esau. Esau was a man who he was a hunter, he loved the outdoor life. His dad was probably very proud of him for that. And Rebecca, her favorite, was Jacob. He was a home loving boy. And she was, uh, and he was her favorite. And obviously, that was abundantly clear to everyone. But even though Isaac had been told that Esau was to serve Jacob, Isaac was still determined that his favorite son would get the blessing. He wanted things his way. He disagreed with God. Rebecca was happy that her favorite son was going to get the blessing. He was going to be. Oh, no. She let him out that God needed help. He couldn't do it without him. Things were going wrong. That uh, Isaac was about to bless Esau. So something's got to be done. And so they hatched this horrendous scheme. You know, a scheme that involved Rebecca lying and deceiving her elderly and blind husband. Think on that for a moment. Deceiving her elderly blind husband. Tragic. And she of course dragged him in. Jacob, I mean, Jacob has to play his part. He's not too happy to start with, but he's prepared to go along with it in the end. And then it seems that everything, you know, the scheme has worked. But of course, then it's exposed. 
And then you've got Esau trying to kill Jacob. So you've got one son, you know, at, at another one's throat. Happy families? I don't think so. Yet, of course, in the providence and the wisdom of God, God overruled and for all things are for his glory. So we've looked at Isaac's faithful, our father, and Abraham. We looked at the fractious family. Now let's look at the faithful blessing. And it is a blessing that is full of faith. Uh, Matthew Henry, the commentator, says about the situation, he says, Rebecca and Jacob are not to be justified in the indirect means they used to obtain the blessing. In other words, just because Rebecca and Jacob seemed to succeed doesn't mean it was right. It was wrong. It was completely wrong and utterly wrong. But yet God, because he is God, he is justified in overruling even the sins of men to serve the purposes for his glory. God doesn't condone sin. He can never be part of sin. He remains outside. We are responsible for our actions. But God so uses those actions for his own glory. And even though Isaac was wrong uh, in wanting Esau to get the blessing, when it came to it, he wouldn't then renounce that blessing when he found out what had happened because he realized that God's sovereign purposes were at work and had overruled what he wanted, that God would have his way in the end. And so we come back to where we started in Hebrews 11, verse 20, and Isaac being commended for his faith. According to Stuart Elliot, he had nothing to look forward to. You know, he was still, he was still looking forward in faith. He, he wasn't going to get what he was about to promise. But you see it, you've held me, blind and frail. Seemed that he'd run his course, uh, that there was not much left for him. So he actually did go on to live quite a bit longer. But yet he knows that he is the child of promise, God's sovereign promise. And so in blessing Jacob, the younger, he is passing on the blessing that he himself received and that his father received before him. And so we have those words that we read in Genesis 27, 27. Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness and abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those you bless be blessed. It's ironic, isn't it? When Isaac was actually saying these words, he thought he got his way, that Esau was going to have the blessing after all. And he got such a shock, didn't he, when he realized what had happened. That he trembled, he shook, because it was such a shock. But he was reminded that, of course, God's ways can't be thwarted, can it? They can't be uh, frustrated or stopped. And so in faith, he doesn't retract the blessing. He says uh, to Esau that I bless Jacob and he will be blessed. And he actually talks about it as if it's already happened. You know, it's, all, it's a done deal, as it were. That's faith, because he knows that that those things will come to pass. He realizes that God does know best. His ways are higher than our ways. And so Jacob was the chosen son. He was the son of promise. And there's that verse that says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Which is God speaking there. And you think, well, how can, how can God hate anyone? But the God, we need to remember that the God loves anyone. He is a miracle of grace. You know, we are all worthy of his judgment. But not one of us deserves God's love. So it's not so much how can God hate Esau, but how can God love someone like Jacob? On the face of it, it seems that Jacob was actually the worst of the two. <laughs> he was a deceiver. His, his name actually means truther or deceiver. Not just here, but we know he, he deceived at other points in his life when he was serving at Laban. Perhaps Isaac sees with the eye of faith that God can still change and use Jacob. 
that ultimately God's purposes will be fulfilled, even through such a man as his, his deceiving son, uh, Jacob. And the other thing we mustn't forget is verses at the end of this chapter, which cover all that went before them. Verse 39 of Hebrews 11. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Jacob was the, only, was, only, was the only one of those three patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who began to see something of the unfolding uh, of this covenant. Now, under that uh, other fractious family, if you like, I mean, do you think um, uh, Isaac of Rebecca's family was a bit of a mess? And think of, of um, Jacob and his wives, because he had uh, two wives, and then he had their two servants as wives as well. And they had 12 children between them. And they were a pretty lost bunch of times as well, weren't they? But the family did begin to flourish. And they had, you know, Jacob had 12 sons. And of course, he, he lived to see uh, grandchildren as well. And so he saw them, saw him, he saw um, Jacob began to see that flourishing uh, that was promised. Had a taste of the Lord's blessing, which was surely by grace alone, remembering that Jacob was a twister and a deceiver before the Lord dealt with him. I wonder if we would have treated Isaac and then Jacob the way we, the way God did. I'm sure we wouldn't have done. Of course, we need to keep remembering that God's ways are higher than our ways. And we see that in scripture time and time again. You know, Isaac blessed Jacob in faith because he didn't see what God was going to do, but he believed that God would do what he said he was going to do. You know, at this point, Jacob didn't even have a wife, yet he was told that his offspring would be multiplied and would inherit the land of Canaan. And so God did indeed bless Jacob over Esau, even though at the time Isaac thought he was blessing the, the older son. He was speaking, as it were, better than he knew. Esau, he prospered too, but his descendants became the Edomites. And they became, sadly, enemies of God's, that, of God's people. That enmity between um, uh, Esau and Jacob, though there was a measure of reconciliation, yet the Edomites went on to become enemies of God's people. And where are the Edomites now? Well, they've gone, haven't they? There's no, there's no trace of, of Edomites left. But how different the children of Isaac. Of course, the Jewish people have continued to, to flourish despite all the, the hardships they have suffered and the persecution around the world. So they flourish in a physical sense, but also, more importantly, in a spiritual sense. Because if we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, whom the old covenants were looking forward to ultimately, then we are the spiritual children, as Jesus uh, teaches in John, John's gospel. We are the spiritual children of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, who had faith in God. They trusted God, we have faith in the same God. So, how does all this apply to us? What can we learn from Isaac's faith and the record that we have of it here in Hebrews well, firstly, we're reminded that God keeps his promises. God always keeps his promises. He cannot do anything else, can he? Because he is a holy, he is a pure, he is a sinless, eternal God. If he was to break his word, to break just one promise, then he would instantly cease to be God. He would not be holy anymore, set apart from sin. He would be a failed God. A sinful God. And that's the reason why we can have absolute confidence in his word. Because his word does not change. And he, because he does not change. And how, how dare we ever impose this? Sadly, the Church of England has done recently saying that you know, God's word on, on sexuality and marriage can be set aside and we can, we can absorb what the culture says. You can't do that. God's word doesn't change because God doesn't change. We uh, cannot impose our will 
and our interpretation uh, on his word when it contradicts what his word so clearly says. But let's be encouraged that God doesn't change and he cannot break his promises, his promises that he made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And so as Isaac put his faith in God and trusted in God, have you put your faith in him? God made that covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that all nations would be blessed through them. And the way that was supposed to happen uh, was that, that um, through, their, through the life and the work and the witness of, of Israel, as they came to be known, as they, were, as they followed God, that was supposed to draw the other nations to worship their God, the God of Israel. They were to be a light to the world as a nation. So people were to be attracted by their godliness and their love and their devotion uh, to the God of Israel. But how often did that happen? How often do we read about that in our Old Testaments? Not very often, is it? More often, Israel, they were drawn to the wicked and idolatrous practices of all the nations around them. And they just absorbed them. Sometimes they even introduced um, um, idolatrous altars and so forth into the very temple of God. They did the opposite of what they were supposed to do. They forgot God and they suffered the consequences. That shows us that the old covenant, you know, we couldn't keep our part of the bargain, of the deal, of the promise. God kept his, but we couldn't keep his. We need somebody else to do it instead. And so came the Lord Jesus Christ, and the new covenant. Because the old covenant didn't work, because we couldn't keep our, our part of it. Uh, one greater than Abraham was needed, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we said before, Christ was the fulfillment of the young Isaac, who his father was prepared to sacrifice, believing God's promise that he would raise Isaac from the dead. So I ask you again this morning, have you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? God's greatest promises in the Old Testament are all about the coming of the Messiah, of the Saviour, of the Deliverer. In a few weeks' time, we'll be thinking at Easter about all that he did in dying and rising again. And that's the greatest problem today, is that people don't realise that they need to be saved from anything. They think that they're fine as they are. Sin is very rarely mentioned. People have no sense of guilt. They have no sense of accountability to God. I mean, they've been told for generations now that there is no God. And as a culture, we just absorb it. And so we just get on with our everyday lives. And if everything seems fine, then why do I need God? It's a tragedy, isn't it? It's because we do need to see, don't we? If, we are, if we're honest with ourselves, and there is a God. We know that uh, in our consciences. We can't make ourselves acceptable uh, to him, can we? Our best works are disgusting in the sight of a holy God. But yet Jesus... He came in our place. He kept the law perfectly with that perfect righteousness of his. And yet on the cross, he died as though he were the worst of sinners. And he had, it's as if he had broken every commandment that God ever made. And that he was dying there for having done that. And of course, he didn't do that, did he? We did it. But yet our sin was put on him. But then, of course, death couldn't hold him. On the third day, he rose again. Christ would pay for his people and, every, and everything that those from the Old Testament looked forward to by faith is fulfilled in Christ. We look back to what happened those 2,000 years ago. And so the big future for us today may look bleak, might it? All that's going on in the world, all the tragedy, all the pain, all the heartache. But with Christ, we have reason for hope, don't we? Because Christ has conquered sin and death, and the grave. And God can work through all kinds of messy and difficult situations and dysfunctional families like this one that we've been thinking about for his purposes and for his glory and for our blessing as well. Remember, it looked bleak, didn't it, when Christ was hanging there on the cross? It looked like his three years of ministry had been a complete failure. He'd had thousands thronging to listen to him. He'd done untold miracles. He'd risen people, raised people from the dead. He'd 
told fabulous, wonderful stories. He had uh, flummoxed the leaders who came to him uh, with their questions. And nobody could accuse him of doing anything wrong. But yeah, after all that, there he was hanging on a cross. You know, the greatest injustice the world's ever seen. Looked bleak, didn't it? But yes, he rose again on the third day. And those who repent of their sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior can know that, that peace and that joy, that hope that the world knows nothing about, but that we know because he has conquered death for us. And then lastly, if you're already uh, trusting in the Lord Jesus, remember what we said at the beginning of the sermon, it was the point of this chapter, chapter 11, that we are surrounded by witnesses who've gone before us, that we might not lose heart, that we might not give up. As some, as some were tempted to do, as I'm sure some of us have been tempted to do. Christ is worth it. Christ is better than all the, the types and the shadows, all the ceremonies that they, the, uh, they were, the Hebrew Christians were being tempted, tempted to go back to. Christ is better. Better promises. A better hope. A better future. Christ is truly satisfying in a way that all the distractions and the, the petty things of this world can never be. So throw off the sin that so easily entangles. Run the race that is set before you. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Not on anything else. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Consider Christ who suffered all things for you. Don't grow weary. Don't lose heart. Have faith in God and know the eternal blessings of being in Christ. Amen. Let us pray. <coughs> Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of faith that you give to those who believe. We know, Lord, that faith and our trust in you is not something that we can stir up in ourselves. Our hearts have to be opened by you. We can't open our own hearts. We are dead in sin by nature. We need your spirit to give us new life. And so we pray, Lord, that this morning, uh, that for those of us who, who have been given new life in Christ, that we would indeed not grow weary, that we would press on, that we would run the race that is set before us, that we would look unto Jesus, who has completed the task. He has uh, risen. He has ascended. He is now seated at your right hand. He has done everything that you required of him. We trust in a finished work. And so, Lord, encourage us onwards this morning as we look to him, the one who has done all things well, the one who will never let us down. And if there are any here this morning, Lord, who have never put their faith in you, Lord, may you, by your Spirit, open their hearts uh, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Lord, confessing their sin, confessing their need, see that Jesus Christ in his death is the only one who can pay the price and the penalty uh, for our sin. So Lord, continue to, to make these words, uh, help these words to, to dwell, our, dwell in our hearts, help us to keep looking to you and trusting in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's come and sing our last song, which is Be Still, My Soul, The Lord is on Your Side.
And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, the glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.